students of Jesus. We're passionate to serve Him. We want others to come to know Him. And all of next year, we will be focusing on that word a lot in application. Mark chapter 9. Mark chapter 9. Each lesson in this little mini-series is devoted to highlighting this concept or this idea. You and I as loyal disciples truly are blessed, divinely blessed, as we remain passionate to serve Him. Zealous for good works. Zealous for good works. May our purpose always be to glorify God as we serve, as we mature, and as we evangelize. And as we'll study throughout this lesson, our mission is never to be seen as a competition. And yet, there is a distinguishing term of praise given to people within his kingdom. Jesus' kingdom is great. And it's natural for us to want to be considered great within it. But how? And for what purpose? Well, unlike the disciples and how they were and how they behaved, who were later utterly shamed for how they argued their own superiority or perceived superiority, we will focus and hopefully be uh, dwelling upon the focus and meaning of Jesus' real question at hand. And the real question is, who are the great? Who are the greatest in the kingdom? And by what standards and by what measures can you and I also be great in God's eyes? It's always amazed me that, and people on the church directory are no exception to this, it's always amazed me that good things can be done from an impure heart. Even without them knowing it, God knows the hearts of men. He knows every time that that's accomplished. But, but the people who are the look at me folks, who truly are the I want praise from you, I want that more than you to praise God, those are the people that are in for a very tragic surprise because popular vote and public opinion will never open heaven's gates for anyone. However, if we solely intend to honor God, to receive His praise, then it's His holy nature that we pursue. Then it is His decrees that we decide to happily do. The God of heaven guarantees that method of seeking Him greatness, a great place in His kingdom and in His presence. Presently, on this earth, you and I should have, as well as I hope we do, it's challenging at times, but you and I should have a joy just knowing that we are doing what God designed us to do. It's satisfying work. Challenging, yes, discouraging at times. We talked about that last week. But in our heart, we know that we're doing what's right. And our upcoming class series this December, January, and February will focus on what particularly you and I are supposed to be doing, whoever you are, whatever gifts and talents that you've been given. That'll be a great class to focus on. But as we're opening our hearts to being willing to do more for the Lord and to do the things that we know we can, amid that joy and amid that encouragement that comes from being with one another for the prodding of love and good deeds, we need to remember something. We need to remember that the purpose of all we do is to glorify God. It's not for self-glorification. It's so that God will be glorified. We know that when he returns, we will re- receive, his, our, uh, receive praise from him. He will actually praise us, and we will share in his glory. We're promised that. But meanwhile, during this time, why are we doing what we're doing? And as I mentioned again and alluded to, everything that we learned today and we're reminded of in class reminds us of the love and compassion Jesus had for us. And that motivates all we give to him, which is a hopefully our all as well. Praise is to God. In the past, maybe you can relate to this. I've been in a few congregations, uh, smaller congregations perhaps here and there. Maybe you can relate that I think due to poor teaching against pride and maybe some understudied uh, teachings on stressing humility so much that 
that we just don't encourage like we should. That's one consequence of this. But ultimately, people have this idea in their head. And it's a good thing if it's coming from a humble heart. But there's a bad idea out there. It may be in your soul that you think good deeds are not to be seen. Well, good deeds are not for show, but they must show. They're not for your show. But good deeds are to be seen for what purpose? Matthew 5, 16. Let your light shine before men that they may see those good works and do what? Glorify God, your Father in heaven. Oh, okay. That makes me think differently. I want people to see the blessings that come from doing things God's way. But ego is a... Well, it can be a blessing. It can, from a good sense, be a blessing. But it can be a beast of a burden. Why does inspired scripture so often remind Christians to not think of themselves less or more highly than they ought? Well, for a lot of reasons, but they, it has to keep telling us because it's so easy, even for Christians um, who are doing different functions, and even more so, perhaps, more prone to doing this when they are working in similar functions of the body to compare it's so easy to compare Satan knows that a whole congregation can go under when any one member starts to have or feel or show that conceited comparison spirit and that's not good um, or even in my early days of the heritage halls for the college I went to they stressed so often that type of spirit that look at me, I'm better than because this is what I do, Spirit, is not to be long in the ministry at all. And I would follow up to that and say it is not to be in the church at all. Such arrogance does not belong in our soul, not in any place of it. And frankly, that road, if we detour and go down that road at all, it leads straight into hell and further deep into it. So our purpose our mission in all that we humbly do is to glorify God. I think we know that. But I appreciate how honest the scriptures are about the people who later become good examples. Not just an example of what we are not to be doing, but later became good examples. Mark chapter 9. Because of human tendency, and these disciples, these later apostles were very much human. Because of human tendency, I can completely understand what happened here in Mark 9. We're going to have a textual study today, but blend a little different style to it as well. Let me ask you, as they were traveling to uh, Capernaum or Capernaum, what could that conversation of ego-driven, I'm better than you discussion have gone like? What could it have gone like? Jesus picked Jesus, uh, these 12 to follow him, and they'd been arguing over who was the greatest and most liked in the kingdom. Wow. Could it have gone something like this? <clears throat> yeah, well, did you see how many people I cleansed from unclean spirits that one trip that we went on? Yeah, I'm getting good at this. I cast out twice as many as you. No, you didn't. That one guy had 12 demons. That counts for uh, that many more. It's not easy to get out that many in one person. But someone says, well, no, that still only counts as one. Don't forget the time that you had trouble casting out a demon because you, Jesus says you had a little faith. Matthew jumps in and could say, no, nah, you both are forgetting that time I threw a party for my friends and what Jesus said about that. Peter tries to suppress them all and says, Hello, does anyone forget about the fact that I was the only one that walked on the water? Don't forget that. And then he would say, I'm the only one who knew and spoke up that Jesus was the Christ. And then someone might remind him, like Andrew says, Whatever, Peter, remember who's the one who introduced you to Christ and who you were just because of that. You would have been a nobody. Where would you have been without me? Judas, of all people, then would chime in and say something like, Yeah, Peter, and let's not forget that you are the one that Jesus called Satan to get behind him for what you said. How could those conversations have gone? Something like that, perhaps. I don't know how long Jesus held in that disappointment as they were traveling, but he waited for the right time. As they arrived in Capernaum, Jesus opened the subject by asking a question. He knew what he was doing. I mean, it's obvious at this point in Jesus' ministry that he wouldn't have even had to see or hear what was going on for him to know what was going on. 
So he asks in verse 33, What are you talking about? <laughs> what are you talking about? They didn't answer. They were shamed. They knew. Oh yes, they knew. They didn't answer because they did not want that verbal rebuke. And yet they still got a form of rebuke. Mark chapter 9, verses 33 through 50 is our text for today. And it's going to be a, a great study for us. We're going to look at three scenes, three little vignettes. We're spending most time on the first one, of course. And each one of these scenes describes for us how the apostles, how these disciples got it all wrong. They just got it all wrong. And by instruction, how you and I can get it right they are good examples right now of what not to do. <laughs> and here are some things that we need to know. As we zealously go about doing good, let's examine these scenes and see what we can learn about who truly is great in the kingdom. I want to be great. I don't mind to tell you, I want to be great in the kingdom. So I've got to learn from the master how to be. Point number one, serve the little people. We're talking here about not stature, but status. No exclusions. This is a harder truth than we might first think. Jesus rebukes and reproves these apostles and their selfish debating. He provides one of the most memorable object lessons in all of Scripture. It silenced them, really, but also to their shame. He focused on a little child that was among them and set them in their midst. He says, if you want to be first... You must be last. And then he illustrated the point by that child and in the midst, drawing focus and attention to them. It should be noticed and noted that in Jesus' day, children were not exactly valued. Now, frankly, too many societies have consistently devalued their children, but to state it nicely, they weren't of any value unless they grew into the culturally prescribed worth. That's sad in any case. So it was very stunning for them, more so them, for them than maybe for us because of how we have grown up in the culture we did where we do value, I believe, kids were taught to. And, and yet they were products of culture as well. I value even the child that I'm hearing right now. It's beautiful. I hope you think so too. That's beautiful. But for Jesus to introduce a child to them, they were products of culture that didn't value them. So we've got to be patient with these disciples. They had a hard time with this point, And this point was clearly made. You serve everyone. And that means anyone. And I'll accept that as an amen too. Why not? They had a hard time regarding everyone being served by them for the reasons Jesus was expressing. Mark chapter 10, verse 13. This is even after this hard lesson. They had a hard time accepting this. They rebuked the little children for wanting to come to see Jesus, but the master, thinking, thinking the master doesn't have time for them. This is more important than them. Their slow spiritual discernment must have been a huge discouragement to Jesus Jesus is more than clear, though, back here in chapter 9, verse 37. Jesus hugs the child and says, Whoever receives one, such as this child, in my name, receives me. And whoever receives me, not only receives me, but him who sent me. So to receive the Father, I've got to accept this, even this child? What's all this mean? Well, that wording... That very wording would certainly make John think about how he behaved towards a certain individual that he didn't accept or receive too well. And quite frankly, because this particular individual threatened John's own sense of self-worth in the kingdom. We'll have to talk about that, but jealousy is bad here in his heart at this time. And as though, you know, have you ever been called out? It's like, Michael, please come to the principal's office. Uh-oh, what did I do? Um... John feels guilt, and so he, on his own accord, asks Jesus a question. And because the answer to that question leads into our next point that we're not quite ready for, hold that thought, set it down, we'll pick it back up in just a moment. But to this young child and this illustration of Jesus, this object lesson, point C, he says this humble service to all people, those who are great in the kingdom 
serve those who are not maybe great in the kingdom. The great are those who serve the seemingly undeserving. Oh, and beyond serving is this concept of accepting. Here's a key point. Serving and accepting really go hand in hand. They're very, very rarely can they be, uh, they're, they're so interwoven that very rarely can they be separated. It, it takes a lot of discernment for that. But serving and accepting, what does this mean? Imagine living during the days of the New Testament uh, times. And we think back to Hebrews 11:31 and how this word describes what Rahab did to the spies in terms of friendly receiving them and welcoming them. Well, Let's apply all of this to how we would have been, perhaps, if we had just happened to live en route to one of the apostles' journeys. How many of us would be so much more excited to tell people, everybody, hey, guess what? Look at me. I welcomed Paul into my home. I gave him some water. Yeah, he was so thirsty. He was so thankful for that. And someone else would say, well, Peter stayed at my home for three days. And then who else could top Maybe some older gentleman or person to say, well, I remember that day Jesus came to my home and he blessed it. Folks, of course we would be thrilled at the distinct honor that that would be. But we would also have to remind ourselves that the very writings and teachings of these people uh, and, and the Son of God would discourage us from bragging about it. So we would have to ask our hearts, is it really any different than the joy we should have to just keep receiving and serving everyone all the time? You know, it's interesting that there's a story told of a man who, uh, I guess it was a church to work day or something like that, where he was so tired from the good things that he had volunteered to do and that he was on his way home. He stopped off at a parking lot and it was just... It was obvious that someone across the way was having trouble with his car, and he had the skills to, to help. But he was thinking, I'm so tired. I don't know. Uh, that, and then there's that awkward moment where you make eye contact, and you know you just can't pretend like you don't know that the person's struggling. So you go over there. He begrudgingly helps out. And there's a, a, a situation, though. This if person doesn't speak English. Not at all, actually. So there's just a few words he could understand that he doesn't speak English and he has no money. And, but, you know, he feels the ob obligation to help. But his spirit wasn't right when he was doing so. So this gentleman from the church was helping and, and got his car going and, and just, you know, quickly got in the car and, and went. He left a car, though, some kind of morphy means of contact. It was obvious. And so he had one maybe leftover car from the do good work day or something like that. And he thought nothing of it other than, boy, that was a delay, a distraction, that was terrible, and I'm glad I'm finally back home. And then a couple days later, a card comes to the church. And it was, an, uh, and it was obviously written from another, but it was filled with expression of gratitude for all the help he was when no one else was around and no one else would serve him. And he just wanted to say, I greatly appreciate your service, signed, Jesus. This was a Hispanic gentleman named Jesus. That was his name, translated. But in his mind, he was thinking, ah, a, lot, a lot of shame, of course, because I begrudgingly served Jesus, and yet he felt happy to remind himself, oh, yes, this reminds me, I was serving Jesus by the things I did for others. In Luke chapter 14, verses 12 through 14, Jesus instructs his followers not to only invite the people who can pay you back. Now, is it a sin to receive providential blessing in return? Of course not. I would question the heart and intent of people who serve only for that reason. God knows. But as I read 1 Corinthians 12, 22, and 25, Paul explains that we need to bestow honor on the lesser honored among us and recognize the weaker are indispensable, as he illustrates with different parts of the body itself. Are we cheerfully serving? Do we look for that next opportunity? We're developing our hearts before we get into the nitty-gritty of the types of work we should be doing, i.e. our upcoming class series. Hope you're a part of that. But I heard another true story of a, uh, a wealthy uncle who had just a few nephews he would see occasionally. They each treated him well, but he wanted to know that their kind treatment was not just for selfish intent. He decides to dress as one of society's nobodies and set himself close to their houses in view long enough to see how they would treat him. 
And the good news is it all went well. But he would divide the, his, inher- uh, their, his, his wealth as their inheritance accordingly. Interesting. If you read Matthew 25, 34 through 46, you can consider whether or not that Jesus himself, the king, has the same approach towards his inheritance, towards our inheritance of his wealth, the greatness in his kingdom because of how we serve and receive everyone, anyone. So now let's pick up that story that we mentioned, that response, that John's question and Jesus' response to that at this next scene. The point is, let's keep this point in our minds, do the small things, do those small things. There was some guy actually casting out demons that they encountered along the journey, casting out demons in the name of Christ. Who was this man? Who is this guy? To think he can do that. Who is this guy that actually can? He's not even following us. Or or he's not even with us as the disciples following Jesus. Who is this guy? Now, folks, since God was blessing his work, does it matter who he was? He was obviously on the Lord's side. That's all that mattered, but not to John. Mm. Even though casting out demons was a good thing, John felt he should stop him. Why? What was John's problem with that guy? Uh, Let's just jump to the point. John felt that perhaps his own efforts to follow Christ earned him more rights or credits to do those mightier works than this other guy had earned. Hmm. That other guy had simply heard about Jesus' teachings and started following him on his own. Good for him. But to correct John's vision... With Jesus' statement about receive, even this person, receive, receive. John, you didn't receive that man. And so John comes out and says in verse 41, "Ah, Truly I say to you, now notice this, let me uh, back up here. Let's read Jesus' statement first. Truly I say to you, whoever provides or serves you a cup of water because you follow me will by no means lose his reward. He has his reward and even doing something like that. Mark chapter 9, verse 41. Now, again, I I, I try to get inside John's mind and discern this. I can imagine what John may have been thinking. Wait a minute, what? Jesus, I know that water is precious. And you can't live without it. But how does that compare to casting out demons? Serving water compared to this seems quite small and quite frankly insignificant. Master, I, I, I should be praised more because I want to do great things in the kingdom for you. Jesus would say, exactly, you want to do great things. So don't overlook those perceivable small things because they're not small. The kingdom's greatest servants are those who don't see any task too small or, shall I emphasize, beneath them. How, and I know a lot of divine elements went into the Pentecost sermon that day. But how many, well, as I compare preachers, how many preachers would love to stand up and preach one sermon and then 3,000 people respond? Ah, wow. And yet how many preachers perhaps aren't preachers because they haven't had the mind to continue because in their hearts they're thinking, a trip to the grocery store just to fill up a box for someone's Thanksgiving dinner seems like a side note inconvenience or maybe even a waste of time. Folks, don't underestimate the value of every good deed. Don't forget where greatness lies. Greatness lies and resides in being willing to do anything. Now you have to know your limits and prioritize time as well. No doubt about that. We all are members of the body collectively, but our own individual responsibility, our own accountability helps us remember this. And of course, the story in 2 Kings 5, Naaman, the Syrian king who, or the captain who had leprosy, a death sentence, heard that Elisha could, see, could save him. So he travels to Israel. He hears to dip seven times in the river Jordan. And he initially thinks that that task was too small for him. He was too prideful to do that at first until a servant of his talked some sense into him. He's like, look, if you would have done some grand task, why not just do this? (laughs) The great in the kingdom do likewise. Letter D, as we do good deeds of all shapes and sizes, 
remember that it's God who is really accomplishing the greater work. 1 Corinthians 3, 5 through 7 teaches this. God gives the increase. He's the God of life. I'm just a servant. Um, John chapter 13. What did Jesus do the very night of his crucifixion and trial before his crucifixion, the night of his betrayal? What did Jesus do? Well, before he conquered death, before he established the redemption plan for all humanity, Jesus did the very last thing that anyone would ever expect a master to do for his disciples. That which was beneath most people of anyone except the menial of slaves. He washed their feet. This was a picture of greatness in the kingdom becoming last. The king of his kingdom serving he didn't argue his greatness and say, I'm not going to do that. I'm reserving my time only for the grander things. Thank you very much. No, our Lord continued to do the small things and the great in the kingdom do likewise. And then our third scene in Vignette will express this point. Not just the small things, but don't exclude the fact that you have to make at time to time the big sacrifices. Mark chapter 9, verse 42 Mark chapter 9 verse 42 focuses again on this young child. Jesus teaches that not only is it important to serve, but you had better protect. Protect. Preserve. Safeguard. He says it would be better for you to be drowned in the sea than for someone lesser or weaker to stumble because of you. Wow, talk about the importance drawn to every soul. Jesus then makes some bizarre statements that seem like it, he just goes off on a different direction. But whenever you see Jesus' statements back to back to back, you have to stop and think about how the gap really is connected. These weird statements, some would say in stressed words, hyperbole, certainly relate to emphasizing the point about big sacrifices. Cutting off your hand, plucking out your eye if it keeps your soul saved. What? What a big sacrifice it would be to do something like that to preserve your own salvation and even your effectiveness in showing God's love. I think we're getting somewhere with this. There are so many contextual points to this difficult passage, but there's one point quite clear. Those who are great in the kingdom make big sacrifices. And it might mean to preserve and protect not only your own soul, but the souls of your siblings in Christ who maybe are not yet learned enough in the scriptures to discern where your liberties are. As we look at 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 7-13, through 13, we see an example where Paul says he would make a pretty big sacrifice. Some would say, I won't even do this or won't even do that, even though I know I can, for the sake of my brethren. Well... We have to ask ourselves, how willing am I to make the sacrifices for the purposes of saving someone's soul? How willing am I to take this serious teaching seriously? And then, anytime we question or doubt this, let's just look to Jesus. And let what we learned and reminded of even today help us see just how much God gave us through His Son. When we look to Jesus... When we ask that question, how much am I willing to sacrifice? It should be pretty obvious. Philippians 2 is a great humility chapter talking about how much Jesus sacrificed. He left heaven to come to earth to die for us. He marched to that cross. And who did he do that for? He did it for us. While we were still sinners, while we were still weak, and while we were still ungodly. Romans chapter 5, verses 6 and 8. This is greatness in the kingdom. So in conclusion, what does being zealous for good deeds look like in Christ's kingdom? It looks like Christ. Just take a long look at Christ. He's the one who served everyone, who did the small things on his path to self-sacrifice. So what about today? What, what does greatness look like in his kingdom? Well, you should be able to look also at Christ's disciples. Those who also serve anyone who are willing to do the small things and because they are daily sacrificing themselves for the cause of Christ. 
to bless others, and to ultimately, going back to that purpose, to glorify God. I hope that all that we do draws people to love Christ and ultimately saves their souls. But don't think about accomplishment or certainly comparison. Just praise God as you continue to serve Him zealously. Are we pleasing to God by the things that we do? I know you want to do more. And I want to inspire that for all good cause. And everything that we're going to be focusing on the next few weeks and in our upcoming class series on Wednesday night starting in December will focus on what you are to be doing. And this will be exciting and it will be fun. But let's all be zealous for doing good deeds to the ultimate glory of God. Praising God for the good deed He done that saved our souls and made salvation even possible. Are we humble enough to do what God has commanded us to do? Naaman held back. He said something like, I, I don't want to just do that. This seems like a little you know, silly command to dip seven times in the river Jordan. Well, the fact is that was God's command. And it was a humbling task. That's probably why I didn't want to do it. I can't help but think that some people are still too prideful to yet respond, as though they much need to, to respond to God's simple command to do what the Bible says for the reasons the Bible says in the way the Bible says. And that is to say, Lord, you've done all this for me. I want to be clothed with you. And I'll do so in the waters of baptism by faith to contact the blood that was shed on the cross. The sinless blood that atoned for my sins and made redemption possible. So that I might live that new life. Zealous to serve because I've been forgiven. That's a beautiful life to live. And I want you to know that joy. And start it as we stand and as we